top, and kind of a repeat of what I've written. Uh, number one, the, the committee that, that was put together was really outstanding. Outstanding in every way. Second thing I would like to say is that I really appreciate all your efforts as far as helping us identify what it is you wanted to know, what, it, what you wanted. And um, truly, we faithfully followed that. There was nothing, no independent thinking. We based it on what the congregation believed. And of course, we did that through the focus groups, which many of you were a part of, um, as well as listening to the vestry, indicating, you know, them indicating what they were looking for. Um, many conversations we had with many of you independently. Um, so that was the basis upon which we started. Um, we, start, in, we started, after, um, after the focus groups, the next process was to uh, put all that information together and put into a, uh, I think you've heard me say it before, electronic portfolio, which is something we've disseminated all over um, for, for potential candidates to look at and make, make an assessment as to whether or not they would be interested. Um, there was a long period of time after we had submitted all that, it took a while to put that together. Um, and there was a period of time where, of course, we had to wait for responses. And the responses came back through the diocese. Canon Stocker brought, brought them to us. Um, this is probably hmm, late July, early August. Um, there were 11 candidates. There were 12 initially, one, one had pulled out before he had gotten to us, but there were 11. We, uh, we looked them over um, and then submitted to each one of them um, two questions. We asked something about what brings joy to your ministry and what is the biggest concern you have, or whatever. I don't remember exactly what the, what the questions were, but there were only two questions, and we asked them to also submit a, a resume with that. Once we got the responses back, and they came back very quickly, which was a good thing, because they were all seriously interested, um, reviewed them, and then basically, they were all great people, first of all, really wonderful people, based on what we could see, what we'd heard. Ken Stocker, when he gave us the names, kind of gave us an idea as to what um, their reputation was and what their strengths were, etc. cetera. Um, we, we decided we needed to cut the field down, we cut it down by five. Primarily, not because of anything they wrote, but essentially what their, um, what their experience level was, recognizing our needs here. We needed somebody we felt that was, was um, very experienced and had some understanding as to, and had the capability of doing what needed to be done. So we reduced it by five, so we had six. Then we interviewed uh, all six of them by Skype over a period of uh, a month and a half. The hurricane got in the way a little bit, and we had a delay a little bit, but we, uh, we got through that pretty, pretty efficiently. And uh, again, got together afterwards and reviewed all the information, the accumulated information, all the communications we had back and forth to each one of them, which were significant. I mean, there was a lot of communication back and forth between us and the, and the individual candidates. Looked at all those and um, decided that there were, we could reduce it again from the six to four. So we, um, we accomplished that. Um, thanked them, thanked for those who we chose not to select for their interest in our, their prayers and our prayers to them, etc. Um, then we um, we scheduled visitations at their <coughs> parish, the four of them. Um, at about the same time, we asked the diocese to do their magic. They they have to do backgrounds and and assessments and so forth to make sure that they agreed that the four that we are considering um, fell within the framework of what they thought was best for St. Phillips. Um, 
So they did that extremely efficiently. I mean, they were, we were told it would take up to six weeks. I think it was done in a week and a half. And that means their assessment um, and their, the, the bishop actually calling around. So we got enormous support from the diocese. Um, I think they were, kind of felt sorry for us because of the hurricane as well. I think we really benefited from the hurricane a long <laughs> Anyway, um, we, uh, we set up interviews at their parish. So it meant um, representatives from the, from the committee went to the parish and actually spent time with the candidates um, before and of course attended the services, listened to the sermon, et cetera. Um, we accomplished three of those. Um, about after we had the third one, uh, one of them dropped out because he felt as though it was just not after prayerful thought and so forth, he decided that it was just not the right uh, time for him as far as his family was concerned. And um, so he very reluctantly pulled out. By the time we got to the fourth one, he called and told us that he accepted a call to another parish. So that was a kind of a relief to us because we had four outstanding candidates. We're having really having difficulty trying to figure out how we we're going to make this decision. So two were removed from consideration. We had two others, we had two remaining. And we, um, <coughs> so we uh, asked each one of them if they would visit us. So we arranged for them to visit us um, here in Southport. They did not attend a service, but they came during the week. We spent a couple days with them. They didn't have a waking moment without somebody from the committee being with them. And we, we took them around, took them to Wilmington to show them um, that there's um, a place other than Southport to shop and so forth. <laughs> um, and then uh, we culminated each one with a uh, dinner with, um, with the uh, priest and his wife at one of our homes and where the whole committee could see them at one time. Up to that point, they were seeing them in groups of two and three. Um, so that was the, the process. So we get to the last day, the 29th, and um, we have two candidates. Uh, we did an anonymous vote. Um, and then we had a lot of discussion, and then we unanimously agreed to uh, recommend um, Father Eric. So that's the whole process in a nutshell, and uh, we're very excited about it. Um, I know that Jim has, has um, had some conversation with him as well as the bishop's chaplain, did you mention that? Um, so we are, uh, we're, we think we did an outstanding job. And we did an outstanding job for all of you. Thank you. Um, I think you did an outstanding job as well. Um, and uh, it's been my privilege to work with, with Bob uh, throughout the process about process. Um, one correction, I have not yet spoken about that's, if he wants to talk, I'm there for him, and, but that's, uh, that's his call. Um, as the scripture says about John the Baptist and Jesus, uh, I must decrease and he must increase. Uh, and so part of what's going on here is um, I will, my last Sunday will be January 6th um, because the diocese and I agree about this. There needs to be space between us. Um, you, need to, you need to erase the ghost of Christmas past <laughs> and, and fall in love with the ghost of Christmas future. Um, and so that'll give a little bit of time for transition as well. 
And that's a piece of what's going on. Father TJ will be in charge. Um, as you know, Father TJ uh, has been called to be the assistant here uh, for a period of time up until uh, Father Eric and he can sit down and decide whether they love one another or it's best to part ways. Um, and so we have arranged for all of that. In the budget, it's all paid for. And I want to say, I'm going to say something about this on the 6th when I have final numbers, but I want to thank Frank Tarzano and all of the stewardship team because a reality is St. Philip's has been waiting since 2004 to have a full-time rector and a full-time assistant. Mm -hmm. And here we are. We are that's, it's going to happen. And uh, so you're going to be lousy with clergy. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, um, the other thing that I want to say about this before I'll, I'll handle any questions you have is that um, the, the studies that talk about how a rector comes into a congregation talk about the ways in which congregations typically behave. Um, and I want to say that my learning in, in the couple of years I've been around the church is that Episcopalians have a disease and it's universal. I don't know whether you get it at baptism or confirmation, <laughs> but you get it. And the disease is called passive consent. What passive consent says is that people will go along at the beginning of any rectorship with everything because they want to get along and seem happy. It's called a honeymoon in some places, you know. Um, but they do not give active consent, they give passive consent. I describe passive consent this way, uh, consent this way. You, everybody stands there and they hear what's going on and they nod and say yes, then they pick up a rock and they go and sit in a circle around the rector, and the first time the rector makes a decision, the rocks start flying. <laughs> um, it is important because, because the, the studies show this, that right now, right today, the vision for St. Philip's that is held by that transition document, the what, electronic portfolio, is that what you called it? What, what was the name of the... Okay, electronic. Okay, the consonance between what Father Eric hopes and what the electronic portfolio states is 100%. That's the basis on which they know each other. That's the basis on which the contract has happened. And as time goes on, the goal for successful rectors is to keep that consistent so that it is the rector's responsibility to help the congregation stay on target, and it's the congregation's <coughs> responsibility to stay on target. And that is to allow the leader to lead, and to be led, and also allow the leadership to lead. That's what we've been working on for the past two years, right? What we've been working on in the boards, and in the vestry, and whatever, is to allow the leadership to lead, to have the power to be able to make decisions about the ministry and the congregation in conjunction with, in consultation with, the rector. And with the support and help of the staff. That's what we do. And your responsibility is to watch out for that passive consent and provide active consent to work with the new rector. Does that make sense? Because okay. it's, it's not easy to, to do that because I've learned about you is that some of you actually have divergent opinions. <laughs> okay, that's why I, I wanted you to hear all these things um, before we have any contact with the new rector and all of that because this is an opportunity for you to make the beginning right. What questions do you have? Wow, I'm so good. <laughs> I'm not that good. Yeah. Yes. I had a question this morning that I think everybody might like to know the answer to. Okay. <laughs> Somebody asked me if we were going to use the money that had been collected for the new building uh, to pay for the, uh, what you call it? I deductible. Know. Deductible. I don't know why I can't remember that word. I can't. It was up there with those three. Deductible. Uh, and the answer is no. 
Those funds are not commingled at all. They are sitting there waiting to build a new building. So don't not pay your pledge. Pay that pledge. It's very important. Very important you understand this. This is a matter of principle, um, and it's also a matter of ethics. <laughs> Uh, when we did a capital campaign, we said the capital campaign was basically for the building of a new parish hall. We presented plans, and everybody made a decision to give or not to give, and the money they gave was for that reason. You can't take money for that reason and spend it on something else. Unless you're Congress. <laughs> Unless you're Congress. <laughs> That's true. You, you can't do that. Okay? because it's a breach of contract. You, you also, even if the thing is important, you, and let, me, let me take it back, you can do it. You can take the money and spend it for something else, provided you get the consent of the donor. So let's say that Bill over here gave $1,000 and said, we're only $1,000 sure for the deductible, okay if we use your capital campaign $1,000 to pay that. And if he says no, we can't. But if he says yes, then we can. We're not going to do that. We will, we will make the deductible dead. <coughs> and, and, and I've got some good news, which you'll hear during the service and whatever about how we're working on that. Uh, but we're gaining on the ability <coughs> to raise the money for the deductible. And we have some other funds that we would rather use for the building of the parish hall. But push comes to shove, we're not going to not take the insurance money because we can't come up with the deductible. Okay, is, that, is, is everybody clear about that? It will not happen. Yeah. Um, on the uh, GoFundMe account, I have heard uh, from some other instance that there is a chunk of that money when you give it that's taken out by the GoFundMe people. There is a surcharge. GoFundMe funds itself. It gets itself done by adding a tax. It's 2%? 1.2%. 1.2%. So if you give a dollar, two cents of addition is what you pay. And then it's not a big number. It's a, it's a small number. Okay. There also is, and this is a fundraising technique they have, and you should be clear about this, on the GoFundMe page, there is a thing that allows you to tip them. <laughs> Seriously. And it comes up and says, do you want to give a 10% tip or a 50 You don't need to do that. The 1.2% you need to do. The other stuff you don't need to do. And many people do not. So if I want to give $100, I'm actually going to give $101.2? Yes. Dollars. Yes. So, so the, the amount of money that's coming to the, to the fund is what you wanted to pay. Correct. So it would be easier, a little cheaper to... You know, put it in an envelope and send exactly. it to Lorraine. Exactly. Yes, which is why, and, and, and parenthetically, let me tell you that at least in my heart, and I think in the heart of the leadership, we don't expect that the people of St. Philip's have to give to the GoFundMe account or to, or to the deductible. And the reason we don't, just so you're all clear, is you did a heck of a job a year ago in our annual fund drive, and you did a heck of a job this year in our annual fund drive. Oh, and parenthetically, we raised almost $1.2 million on top of that from you all. So, so we're going outside, and the reason for going outside is we are getting donations from all over the country. Last week, we got a $250 donation from a guy who was my senior warden in Cincinnati. Heard about it, went to GoFundMe, and did that. Okay. You have friends, you have relatives, you have friends, relatives, you have relatives, friends. <coughs> All of those people who are not members of St. Philip's, we're hoping they will go to the GoFundMe page. Okay. If you feel so moved to make a contribution, great, we're not going to turn it down. But this is not a campaign directed at the people of St. Philip's. <coughs> is that clear? Other questions? Yeah. Uh, since the budget was already in place before this, uh, announcement, and obviously there had to be negotiations between St. Philip's and, and yes. Father Eric. Um, were we able to fall within the budgetary projection uh, in terms of salary and benefits without <laughs> naming any specific amount? The, the, I, Bob, you want to answer that or I'll answer it? 
I would say for the most part, yes. There's, there's a couple of things like uh, the specific medical plan that was selected and how that uh, relates to what we had projected, but all in all, I'd say the answer is yes. Yeah. And, and I want to say that from my perspective, having been involved in more than one of these searches, not only as a participant but as a consultant, um, that it was a sweetheart <coughs> conversation. It was, it was um, both sides wanted to make it work and they did make it work. Yeah. When you say active consent, what does that look like? Active consent looks like you subordinate your opinion to that of the new rectors. You allow the new rector to lead. Now, I tell, let me tell you a story about that, okay? Um, I used to do a thing like this at Church of the Redeemer in Cincinnati. And we had a big group of people, and one of our members, uh, who was faithful, uh, was the daughter of the then presiding bishop, John Allen. And he used to come every once in a while to see his grandkids, like you all do, you know. And so he would come to church, and I persuaded him one time to talk to this forum. And somebody asked him a question, and the question was, um, how do you feel about clergy who expect to be obeyed? And this is what the presiding bishop said. I, I never forget it, because he, he, was, he was brilliant, I thought. He said, when it comes to matters of the faith and the future of this congregation, you ignore your rector at your soul's peril. When it comes to matters like who's going to be the next governor or senator or president, and your rector expresses an opinion, tell him to go to hell. <laughs> That's not so, so appropriate consent. Okay? It's not blind let's go to Jonestown and drink the cooling consent. It is using your brain, because we're Episcopalians, you're allowed to have brains in the Episcopal Church. But it does mean you're accepting the leadership of the person you have called to be the leader. It's not that hard. Does that help? Yes. Somebody else had a hand up. Yeah. I just had a question, I think, more for Mr. Wright. Um, were the findings of Mr. the... Mr. Wright's back there. Back there um, I'm Mr. Wrong. I'm Mr. Treasurer. <laughs> I couldn't turn that far. Um, were the findings of the Renewal Works Committee considered as shown as part of the each candidate? Did, did you hear that, Bob? No. Uh, were the, was the data collected from Renewal Works and that survey a part of what the committee considered? Yes. Yes. Uh, my question is, expenses of bringing the priest to visit and his family, is there a fund from the church? How was how that happen? Uh, because your vestry is really filled with smart people, <laughs> last year when we did a budget for 2019, they included expenses for the search, expenses for the search committee members to go out to the various congregations, moving expenses because we thought the rector, the new rector Mike could come depending upon how fast the search process went, what, what would happen if the new rector came in last September? So we had a full quarter of the new rector salary in that, which is money we have saved since then. Okay, um, All of that was put together. So the answer is yes, it was. it's fully funded, and we did not go into it. it's a nickel of debt. We, we covered that beautifully. Thanks again to the leadership, which, which primarily was um, the Finance and Facilities Board. Paul. Didn't Father Eric's uh, congregation also do renewal works? Yep. Yes. Yep. What was his question? Did Father Eric's congregation also do renewal works? And the answer is yes. So he's familiar with that and, and that process as well. And that's in this folder that we've collected is all of data like that. Because obviously we didn't come out the same place that St. Anne's did. Because we're different. <laughs> Other questions? Okay, well, um, we are done. And we are done early. But I'm glad you were here. Um, please know that uh, our opportunity continues to be the people of God 
in the Moose Lodge and to be the people of God in Southport. And that, uh, that doesn't change no matter what. Um, and you'll be hearing a lot of these things in the next several um, weeks. Uh, the new reorganization of the vestry, uh, you, be, uh, you look on the website, you'll be able to see the, the strategy, the strategic plan 2.0 as it's been revised, uh, who, who the new leaders are uh, in each of the boards and, and all that. All that's coming up, so stay tuned. Thanks. Thank you.